Hello everyone, let's get the meeting started please, grab a seat. All right. Okay, let's get the meeting started. Um, good evening everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Markov, I'll be your host for this evening introducing the uh, presenters. Uh, welcome to the uh, final uh, Recreational Astronomy Night meeting of the Toronto Centre RASC. Um, the uh, speakers for tonight are, as you can see on the screen, uh, the Sky This Month will be presented by uh, Ed Trace, uh, followed by uh, Scott Masterton, who will talk to us about Eclipse Odyssey, Journey to Nebraska. And then we have one final presentation uh, uh, on the Solar Eclipse Roundup. Uh, John Bodanowitz will uh, uh, give us uh, his view of the eclipse, his, uh, uh, I guess, memories of the eclipse uh, from way back in, in August. And uh, we may or may not have uh, more such presentations in the new year. We may have run out. Uh, we'll see. And then finally, um, we'll have Ron McDodden talking to us about a visitor from another solar system. Um, show of hands, uh, do we have some new members uh, or people who are here for the first time, even if you're not members? <laughs> okay, very good. Thank you for coming. Hopefully we'll see you again. Uh, we, we have some calendars for sale at the end of the meeting, uh, just a reminder. And I think we're probably ready to get started. So I'll call on Ed to present the sky this month. It's good. The light is red. It always scares me. So I'm just in the late stages of a cold, so I'm going to try to hold it together for uh, my presentation. Always a good thing to do. Um, we're trying a few different things uh, and, and going back and forth, so we'll see how it works tonight. So. Sorry, where's the and There we go. So I'm doing the sky this month, and this particular month has got six weeks. I counted them up. Because our next meeting's actually on January the 24th. So there are good things and bad things about uh, trying to do astronomy in uh, this time of year. Lots of darkness, uh, bright constellations, days off work or school, holidays. But the bad thing is, as you even see outside today, the weather. Um, it's very unpredictable and it's not very favorable. And people have many other events and commitments, so they don't necessarily have time. So I kind of set this presentation up to give you ideas that you can do, like without a lot of overhead, being able to see stuff just visually or using binoculars, just grab and go. So as far as day and night goes, we just completed the period of earliest sunset. Um, then we're coming up to the longest night, which is about 11 and a half hours of full darkness. That's not twilight, that's actual darkness. And over 15 hours of no sun, which includes some twilight. Um, so you could actually feasibly go out and observe for two hours get eight hours of sleep, and get up and observe for an hour and a half, all in perfect darkness. Um, latest sunrises come at the start of January, but that's actually a little bit asterisk, because actually the latest sunrise we had was on that Saturday before we switched to uh, daylight savings time, but not by much. Um, the point I'm trying to make is very likely we'll be out after dark, or when it's dark, either in the morning because we have to leave early, at night when we leave work or school, it's dark. So I encourage everyone to look up and I'm going to give some ideas of things to look at because this way you can actually do it while you're outside and if it's clear. Um, so in terms of darkness, there's a, I don't know if people are familiar with the uh, website timeanddate.com. I always find it quite useful, so I'm going to, uh, oops. Am I going to open? Right. 
right. And we'll maximize this. So you can you can look on Bay and Bay and uh, dateandtime.com and the actual URL. I uh, actually can read it easier up there. If you go to slash sun slash Canada slash Toronto, um, you get this thing and it's kind of neat. Oops. So this is actually a pull one so you can find out exactly when, when twilight is, when darkness is, when the sunrise is for any time. So as I drag it across, you can see it gives all that information, which is kind of fun to play with. That's how I can say that the earliest, latest sunrise is actually over here on that last day. And you can see how we're in the very pinched part where there's not much day and a lot of night. Um, just while we're here, there are other useful things on this website. Um, if you go to Moonrise and Moonset. Again, it's for Toronto, and you can probably enter any location. And, and you get like super detailed stuff. Um, even the Observer's Handbook doesn't cover it, especially for your particular location. So I can tell that today the moon rise rose at 2.25 p.m., and it'll set tomorrow morning at 8.25 p.m., the phase, everything. So it's kind of a neat, uh, neat website, and I go there just to check things out quite a bit. So. That's why I'm uh, mentioning this. Oops, that resets everything. Okay, so first thing to note, meteor showers, the Geminids are tonight. Um, they're bright, supposedly up to 120 per hour, according to uh, space.com. The moon won't interfere, but the sky, as we saw coming in, is not so good. Um, I just included the current Clear sky, uh, clear sky chart for the DDO, and you can see it's no good until like 5 a.m. when it turns clear tomorrow morning. So maybe if people are up early in the morning, take a look up. The moon is out, but it's a very thin crescent, so it's not going to be too much of a problem. Maybe you'll have a chance to, uh, chance to catch some meteors. Uh, the moon. Uh, this, this was actually Blog TO's post for... Uh, on the same day that we had our annual general meeting, so they really like to uh, really like to have their uh, very exciting headlines. Everything's iconic and curated and responsibly sourced. <laughs> what they're referring to is the fact that the Je December full moon was a super moon, all the big hype about that, and January's first is pretty big too, and the one on January 31st is also pretty big. So hey, it's iconic triple super moon set to rise over Toronto skies. I thought that was a neat, neat thing to look at. So the major moon phases that we're dealing with, um, December 18th is the new moon. Um, according to wherever I picked that up, it's the micro moon. And that's because if it's a super moon at full moon, it's going to be really far away. When it's a new moon, it's very small, but you don't see it anyway. Um, first quarter is December 26th, Boxing Day. Uh, January 1st, 9.24 p.m., full moon, another super moon, also called the wolf moon. Then we're into third quarter, new moon on January 16th. And then for, I guess, the next meeting, um, there's a total lunar eclipse. But unfortunately, because the moon is uh, totally full at 8.26 a.m., by that time, the sun is actually up in Toronto. So we only see the beginning phases of it, and we don't see the totality from Toronto have to go west. This is another website that I like to look at because I find sometimes the moon phases don't quite make a lot of sense in my head and having the picture of what the moon actually looks like on every day is kind of neat. So the thing I'll point out, obviously I took the screenshot yesterday, today the moon's going to be like that. So like I say, if it's clear early in the morning, you might be able to see some meteors. This is also a good time, right through here, to see the really waning crescent moon, almost before new moon, because, I mean, people see the new moon and, and early crescent moon in the evenings all the time, but to see this in summer, you'd have to be up at, I don't know, 3 a.m., whereas now you can go out at 6.30 in the morning, and you can see it quite, quite far up in the sky. And if you want to observe anything, I don't know, 
Um, I didn't study the observing certificate for the moon, but if there's stuff on that limb, this is a good time to observe that. Um, same thing out here. As we get close to the new moon, you can check out, and that's in January 14th and 15th, and kind of mid-January. So the moon does do a few tricks. Um, there's an occultation of Aldebaran. Unfortunately, the moon is almost full, so I think the light from the moon is going to make it a little bit less spectacular. But the dark edge of it will occult it. And in Toronto, that'll be at 6.21 p.m. And just the dark edge will be going across Aldebaran. And then at 7.19 p.m., it'll reappear. So it's nicely placed in time. Um, what you'll see is there's not much stuff that happens in the early evening. But this is one of them. Then there's the total lunar eclipse, which is also the blue moon, second full moon in January. I'm sure we'll hear all kinds of hype, and it's a super moon, and who knows what all. Um, but the moon sets from Toronto before total eclipse. And I assume that everyone who's a uh, RASC member gets Sky News, and these things are covered in Sky News, so you can look it up there. Um, November, December, January, February, respectively. So the interesting thing about the January 1st full moon is that it's 66 degrees high in the sky. And I actually got that from that time and date. I just kind of poked through there. And it's the highest full moon in our sky since December 10th, 2011. And also it's a super moon, so that's kind of neat. Um, it will, but because the moon's orbit wobbles around the Earth, it will actually have higher and higher full moons around the winter solstice until about uh, the top highest might be on December 14th, 2024. So it will be higher, but this is the highest it's been for quite some time. So I would say that if uh, January 1st in the evening it's clear and crisp and the snow's on the ground, which sure looks like it's going to be, get out into the country and take a walk under the moonlight. I mean, it's, you can't really observe, but it's quite magical walking under the full moon, the snow, the stars. I mean, the stars are bright enough in winter that you will actually see them. So it's another astronomical experience that you can have, I think. So planets, what are the planets doing? Um, all the bright planet action is in the pre-dawn sky, so you're going to have to get up early, but not too early because it is winter. Um, there are two interesting conjunctions coming up. Uh, you can use a telescope to view Uranus in the evening sky, and it'll, it's kind of on the meridian due south at... Uh, and it starts getting dark. And you can view Mercury in the morning sky. I don't know that people are necessarily using a telescope. It's not a great view, but it never is a great view. Um, other planets will be better positioned for serious observation later in 2018. Venus is gone. It's behind the sun. It will reappear as an evening star in 2018. And Pluto is also behind the sun. I'm still bitter that Pluto isn't a planet. So I included it, and, uh, but you can't see it anyway. So let's just see what we can do here to <coughs> minimize this. Their startup Stellarium, which is, yes. you know, the icons are awfully small. I squint. <laughs> Sorry. Mm hmm. So right now it's just giving us the current time. What I'm going to do is I'm going to move time ahead. Hmm, it's not stopping time. There, time has stopped. So this is tomorrow morning at about uh, 7 a.m., or sorry, 6 a.m. from Toronto. South is there, east is there. So you see Mars, Jupiter, and the moon. It's an okay grouping. I mean, you can go out and have a look if it's clear, and the clear sky clock does, in fact, say that, um, and catch some meteors. So I'm going to step through the days, and we'll see how uh, things behave.
so the moon zips out of sight very quickly in this, and you'll see it kind of pop in and out. You can see that Mars, Jupiter kind of gets higher and higher in the sky at the same time, while Mars is in retrograde motion, so it's uh, moving along in the other direction. So now we're at the first, second, third, fourth, getting pretty close, fifth, sixth. So just, uh, oops, let's select an object. So there's Jupiter, but if I center it on Callisto, there's Mars. And that eyepiece is a half degree field of view, which is basically the size of the moon. So those are close together. Um, they're equally close together on the 7th, only Mars has kind of moved a little bit below that. This one's easier to show in Stellarium like this. Um, so those two days, both days for us, the Moon and Mars are like a quarter degree apart, maybe a third of a degree apart. Um, I would say if you've got a telescope, this is worth taking a look at because a low power eyepiece will get both of them. Um, but even in binoculars, it should be good. Naked eye, I'm looking forward to seeing it. I don't know quite how it will look. Mars is not as bright. Jupiter is going to be obvious. Mars may be a little bit harder compared to the brightness of Jupiter. Um, if we get out of this, actually, we zoom in on this. So we see that uh, Jupiter, again, I have to look up here. Um, its magnitude is minus 1.83, so there's no problem seeing it. But at the same time, Mars' magnitude is 1.44. It's quite a lot dimmer. So like I say, we'll see. Um, let's go back to about the regular kind of full sky field of view and step on. So there's one other event that happens. And again, this is in Sky News, which is the moon joins Mars and Jupiter. And that's on the morning of the 11th of January. So there's another kind of photo op. Mars is a bit further from Jupiter. Um, it's still, it's gotten a little bit brighter and a little bit, I don't think it's any higher actually. So there's another photo op. And then as time goes on, they actually separate. And we're approaching, by the way, that's Scorpius, that's Antares right there. So it's actually heading into the summer constellations. So I'm going to go back to um, I'm going to go back 6 a.m. That's six. Well, 6 a.m. is just the time that I stopped it at to step it through. So obviously at 6:15 it's going to be a bit higher, but the light will be starting. If you went out at 5:30, it would be lower. So six o'clock seems like an appropriate time. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, morning. All the all bright planet action is in the morning. Have to get up early. Well, you're gonna miss out then. So I'm gonna set it to 7 a.m. now, and we're back to. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to. Uh, Well, Mercury, and actually today Mercury is in superior, con sorry, inferior conjunction. It's between us and the sun, but it's a zippy little planet. So even though it's right by the sun right now, um, it's not really going to be a problem, as you will see. So the 14th, 15th, 16th, popping up from the horizon, 17th, 18th. The fatter the dot looks, the easier it will be to see. So that's not too bad. That's, if you're not doing anything on the morning of the 25th, that would be a, a good time to go out and take a look. <laughs> um, it's, 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 it's magnitude minus 7, so that's pretty good. And in fact, all, all through to about the end of December, it's good. Then it starts dropping back down. But the next thing that happens is on the 12th and the 13th, it meets Saturn. And I would say that you want to try to, oops, 
Oh, wrong way. I would say you want to try to look for it on the 12th because you, you're going to see Mercury. Saturn's going to be a lot harder to see. Mercury is going to be your guidepost, and it's dropping down very quickly and also getting fainter. So you have a chance to go out on the 13th, on the 12th, sorry. Go and take a look. This is at 7 a.m., and you can see that it's quite low. Its um, altitude is 4 degrees. So if you remember the old trick of holding out your hand like this, it's like a knuckle and a half up. So you need a low horizon. But Mercury will be bright enough to be seen, assuming it's clear. OK, so that's, that's kind of the planets. I'm going to go back to my presentation. Oh, I shouldn't press F5, should I? So Mercury is best viewed in late December, reasonably high, 7 a.m.-ish, east-southeast. Um, Jupiter aligns with Mars in the early dawn sky. Is the moon in the seventh house? I don't know. <laughs> ah, the old people got it. Um, Moon, Moon, Mars, and Jupiter are uh, together in the early dawn of Tuesday, Thursday, January the 11th. And Mercury and Saturn close together Friday, January 12th and Saturday the 13th. And again, if you look in your copy of Sky News, the best things to see, it's all in there. Okay, for stars and constellations that you can see, um, late December evening, actually, the summer triangle is still visible. It's setting, but it's up. Um, Setting in the east and Orion is, sorry, it's setting in the west, good heavens, and Orion is rising in the east. And because the nights are long, they actually end with Orion having already set and Vega and Deneb coming up in the east again. So I'm going to introduce something that, that stood out to me, it stood out for me for a while, and I call it the winter arc, but it's not, maybe not the greatest name, it's the name I kind of think of it. Um, the stars Capella, which is the brightest star in Auriga, and Menkelman, which is the second brightest star in Auriga, and then you kind of arc over to Castor and Pollux and Gemini. You go over to Procyon. It just continues this lovely arc. And you go to Sir Sirius and Canis Major. And it's not quite so good, actually, early in winter. But once you get into you know even springtime, you'll at, at sunset, Orion is setting, and it makes this wonderful arc, and it's quite visible in the sky in the west as well. So we'll just um, use Stellarium again to... Uh, I, I blame the Benadryl. <laughs> Did I take the nighttime or the daytime? <laughs> <clears throat> hmm. I'll show you what I'm kind of talking about here, I hope. So this is again right now. To turn on some constellation markings. Oops. Oh, I know what's going on. Uh, which one do we need? Oh, it's way down at the bottom? Okay. Okay, so the arc that I'm talking about, well, actually, I'm going to just turn off the lines and constellations a little bit. I'm going to run time forward. Oh. So there's Auriga, and this is the second Menke, whatever, is the second by the star in Auriga. Then you follow the arc over to here, and you can come right over to here, to Procyon, and then it comes down to Sirius. And it kind of is an arc over Orion. Now I'm going to turn the constellation stuff back on. There we go. Sorry, the screen is kind of, that's better. Now. You can say, well, you know, this is not really the way that we look at things.
But the interesting thing is that if you look at other cultures, they actually see different things in the sky. And, you know, on a cloudy night, you can play with Stellarium and you can actually take a look at some of this. So that's actually in the star lore. If we go to, say, the Lakota, totally different. Um, not only do they have this arc and they actually complete it as a full circle and it's called the uh, racetrack. They've got the small little bear's lodge, of, which is what we think of as Gemini. And instead of Orion being a human figure, and like every time I look at Orion, I think, oh, that's got to be a human figure. They see an animal hand. And I think it's kind of interesting to try to, seven little girls is the Pleiades. So this is kind of another thing that you can go and look for and see whether you can see the sky in kind of different ways. And just for another, just for another uh, example, the Polynesians also saw this arc, except they call it uh, the baler. And I think that uh, you can see what importance they attach to that pattern, because if you're in a canoe in the middle of the Pacific, having a baler on hand is probably something that you really want. Um, if I zoom out a little bit, I'll just go back to our regular view just because it's... Uh, so I'm going to just run it up to... I have five minutes? Okay, so on January the 1st, we're talking, this is about 11 o'clock, this is what you have. Of course, it's the full moon, but all your winter constellations are up. I'm going to go out and continue on the uh, presentation. There's got to be a full screen that isn't F5. Right. Print slide. Okay, I'll... So I'm also talk about a constellation, Canis Major, which is quite far south and best seen in January. Um, it contains the brightest star in the sky and other interesting stars as well. So again, something to look at. So there's a star map, and this is actually a good one for where we are in Toronto, because the, our horizon is actually down about here, and this is about halfway up in the sky, this zero degrees. So this star map actually shows you, like in that sort of arc, if you're looking due south and Canis Major is to the due south. There's a picture that I just grabbed, kind of purporting to show what it looks like visually, except you don't see those lines very much. So Sirius is quite a bright star. It's magnitude minus 1.46. Magnitude's a tricky scale, and you think, well, you know, Sirius is bright, but there are other bright stars in the sky. So I don't have time. I'm not going to go through all the math, but basically... Here are, the stars. Oops. Here are the stars in Orion that I got from Wikipedia. They have lists of stars and constellations. And you can see there's Rigel and Betelgeus, and there's their magnitudes. So I did a calculation here and calculated how bright that star is compared to Sirius. So Rigel is about a quarter of the brightness of Sirius. And basically I added everything up. I left out some rows there to uh, almost magnitude 5. And Orion, all of Orion's stars together make up about 90% of Sirius's brightness. If you think of it another way, you could take Sirius and split up its light, and you can make Orion, and you can probably make some dim constellation or two beyond that. Um, Centaurus is a pretty bright constellation. That's the only one I could think of that's bright, so I did the same sort of thing. Wikipedia is great because you just copy and paste. Centaurus is a little bit brighter, but it's a honking huge constellation. But by the way, Sirius will be getting brighter. In 60,000 years, it'll be even brighter. And then, so what this means, why the dog is big, why it's Canis Major, it's the brightest constellation in the sky. That's why I wanted to feature it. Um, Sirius can almost pull this off all by itself. But it does have some other stars. Um, five star selection. Um, Adhara, which is the second brightest star, it's a supergiant. It's... According to Wikipedia, the brightest ultraviolet source close to us ionizes lots of gas, so it's probably interesting to look at in a telescope to see if it looks blue. And uh, about 4.7 million years ago, it shone with a magnitude of minus 3.99. 
That, that's like as bright as Venus. That would have been an incredible sight to see in our sky. Um, Wazen, which is the next brightest star, is uh, that's just a regular old supergiant. Mirzam, um, it was the brightest star about 4.4 million years ago. Apparent magnitude minus 3.65. Again, like way brighter. The comparison we did between Sirius and all these other stars in Orion, Sirius could not even compete with these stars. And um, this final star, it's not very bright right now, but it will be the brightest star in the sky in about 2.9 million years ago. But it's kind of sucky, minus 0 0.88. So we're, we're doing pretty well right now. And I just, I just included the map again, just to have a quick look. So Adhara, which is the one that's got the ultraviolet, is right down there. It's the rear paw. Basin, which is delta, is the dog's the base of its tail. Um, so beta Mersem, which was the brightest star, is the front paw. And then Aludra, which is Eta, oops, is the tip of its tail right there. So Sirius is the brightest star now, but in the past, these two stars were the brightest. And that star that will be brightest in the future, it's, I don't know where it is on this map. Um, and the bonus object is M41, which is south of Sirius. So if you look at Sirius in binoculars, you can take a look at M41. It's a pretty easy object, nice bright stars, nice view. Um, just have a curious question, because Sirius is a double star, but has anyone seen that double in the telescope? No, it's very hard to see. The one interesting thing is it's actually, its companion is getting further away from Sirius, and it'll be kind of the next 10 or 15 years, it'll be as favorable as it gets. Um, I imagine it's still going to be a challenge with visually or with imaging, but that's another interesting thing about Sirius. So if I just can start up Stellarium once more just to show something else that's kind of interesting. And then it's the end of the presentation. There's probably a way to flip back and forth, but it's a little bit tricky. So again, I'm going to turn on this. Ah, it defaults. It's defaulting to uh, the Lakota. That's interesting. I recognize the Lakota, actually, because I was going to talk about it, and I'm thinking, why is it coming up right away? And we're actually going to go to the same place, but Instead of that, um, we're going to go to the Inuit. And there's a couple of interesting things here. First of all, they actually have a little bit of the arc here, but they call it the collarbones. Um, this is an interesting, uh, that's Persian. That's what we call Persian and they call it the name of a murdered man. And I was really intrigued by that, and I was glad that actually this current issue of Sky News covers uh, Canis Minor, which is the star that Persian is in, and actually gives you more details. So I encourage you to go to your Sky News and read that article and find out a little bit more about why it's called the name of a murdered man. And the final thing is, this is serious, and it's called flickering. And the reason it's called flickering, I think, this is my theory, but I think it's a good one, is it, Sirius doesn't get that high for us, but once you get, say, up to the Arctic Circle, it never gets more than 10 degrees above the horizon. So if you put out your fist like this, it's like a fist's height above the horizon. And given the cold air and the winds, it's going to be sparkling like anything. And I've experienced that personally sitting on my friend's dock, which faces north. And in the late summer, early fall, Capella is kind of scooting along the horizon. My friend goes, that's a really flickering thing. What is that? And I say, it's Capella. Well, Sirius is like five times, six times brighter than Capella. So I imagine it flickers like anything. And that's why they call it flickering. So it's kind of interesting to poke around with the different cultural things and try to kind of see different things. And when you get a chance to look up, try to remember that and say, can I see the sky in a slightly different way? So that's, that's it. And thank you.
any questions? Any questions for Ed? And I'm going to pass you the microphone. Yes. Uh, when will uh, Pluto be visible again? Well, because it's be because Pluto is basically not moving. Like it's so far away, it basically doesn't move against the background of the stars. I'd say if you give it two, basically you're waiting for the sun to move away from Pluto rather than Pluto doing anything particular. So I would say, I mean, and it's going to be in the morning sky. So I would say, you know, give it. Honestly, if you wait until summer, it's probably fine, and then it'll be kind of in the sky at midnight. But it probably will take at least three or four months, and then you'll be looking for it in the early morning sky. Uh, I guess it's in Sagittarius right now, which will never get very high up either. So it's not greatly located for us. Yeah, I, look, I looked at that web page and said, well, it's, it's a dim star, though, in a field of dim stars. One day I'll tell you our experience in trying to see Proxima Centauri in a star field with lots of stars around it. It didn't work at all because there's a billion stars and one of them was Proxima Centauri. Yes? Sorry? <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> I understand there's still politics going on over this, and I think the original decision was political as much as anything else. So it's not really fact-based one way or another. Everyone has a point. Who knows? All right, thank you. All right, thank you very much, Ed, especially for still doing the presentation, given your cold. Thank you so much. Our next presenter is uh, Scott Masterton. Come on up. And, uh, oh, you're going to get wired up here with a microphone. And Scott will tell us about his uh, journey to Nebraska to watch the solar eclipse. Test, test. Okay. Hello? Yes. Okay. Eclipse Odyssey. Uh, this was an odyssey because we took four weeks to uh, get to Nebraska and, and back. Uh, so we had that opportunity and I thought I would share the tr part of the trip. There's, there's astronomy business in there, okay? <laughs> like the Adler Planetarium, okay? The, so. And uh, so let's get begin, let's start. Uh, so for those of you who might not know exactly what an eclipse is, it's a special alignment of the sun, the earth, and the moon. And you can see that the shadow of the moon uh, comes onto the uh, earth's surface. And that only happens at certain times. It doesn't happen every month because their orbits are tilted. So in August the 21st of, last, of this year was the last time this happened. So eclipse facts. In this particular case, it started northwest of Hawaii, sweeps southeast, crosses America from Oregon through the central USA to South Carolina, ending in the Atlantic, and I believe it even went to Africa briefly. Clear weather favors the western states, so we decided we'd head out that way. Total eclipse duration of about 2 minutes and 40 seconds. The shadow moves pretty fast, depends on its position, but up to 3,000 miles an hour in Oregon and 1,500 in the central states. So it's pretty fast, and it's moving in the same direction as the Earth, so it rotates. The size of the shadow is about 70 miles wide. Eclipse facts. How to predict eclipses? Well, the Babylonians are the guys that we have to thank for figuring this out. They studied these uh, eclipses, and they figured out that there's a what they call the Saros cycle, Solar and lunar eclipses re uh, repeat their orbital ge geometry every 6,585 days, or 18 years, 11 days, and 8 hours. They don't repeat in the same place because the Earth rotates. So, 
But the same uh, eclipse uh, mechanics were, occurred 18 years ago. Um, this is the path of totality across the Earth. And uh, I don't think there's been one for quite a, I think, it was what, 70, 79, I guess, the last eclipse that I saw around here. It was only partial. So Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. I got a t-shirt here. There's my Scotts Bluff, Nebraska t-shirt. Uh, they were preparing for this for a year. That's the location. It's just on the edge of, the, of totality. Um, and it, the, uh, the duration was just uh, over a minute and 40 seconds. Grand Island was considered to be the, uh, the best location in Nebraska, but those guys were scared of the weather, so they journeyed here to Scotts Bluff. We saw them at, at Scotts Bluff. I think the, it was the uh, NYAA, North York Association, that went there. Anyway. So why Nebraska? Good weather prospects. Uh, clear skies, 25%. Scattered, 11 Overcast, only 15% of the time. The duration was a minute and 42 seconds. My cousin lives there. That helps. <laughs> and he's the mayor of Scotts Bluff. So <laughs> he made me the official eclipse photographer for Scotts Bluff. He gave me a letter. It helped with parking. <laughs> this is our uh, accommodation. So we dragged a trailer. It was you know, an opportunity to do it very uh, economically, and uh, we, we, had, we towed this trailer and set up in, in parks all across uh, the northern United States. 10,000 kilometers was the total duration. First major stop was at the, uh, in Chicago, the Adler Planetarium. You've probably heard of it. I had reservations about Chicago. It's the murder capital of the United States, <laughs> 750 shootings, deaths, in, uh, that's two a day, and they map them. So I was concerned, but uh, we didn't hear any gunshots. We all survived. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I would, I would say you stick to the, the main, the major areas, and you're good downtown. The Adler, you see, is right on Lake Michigan. It's in a spit that sticks out into the uh, lake. Uh, parking is good, so, and we, uh, there's uh, exhibits there. We saw a flown Gemini capsule, 12. Could see it there. I'm sure even Superman would have trouble changing in that phone booth. Um, this is this model of the, the Mars Spirit rover, and that's my daughter. <laughs> and then, having survived Chicago, <laughs> we went to the Badlands National Park. You have to watch for rattlesnakes there. They, they warn you. But it's, it's the Badlands. It's like uh, Drumheller here in Canada. Um, Rapid City, South Dakota, Mount Rushmore. These are the, the faces of four presidents of the United States. Uh, Gutzon Borglund was the uh, sculptor, and, and basically he started in 1927, uh, asked the government for money, it, and of course after the, uh, the Depression they wanted to encourage uh, people to work, and a lot of the park uh, facilities were built during that time. In this particular case, uh, the, the sculpting went on until uh, 1941. So you have Washington, who's the uh, preserver of the, of the republic in, in Gutsum's uh, idea. He, he selected these uh, faces. Um, after uh, touring uh, New England and seeing all these Signs that say, George Washington slept here. Well, that's how we know he's the father of the country. Um, <laughs> then then um, Jefferson, second president of the United States. Uh, third, thank you. Uh, he, anyway, he made a deal that, would, that Donald Trump would be envious of. The Louisiana Purchase, he doubled the size of the United States for $15 million. You can't go wrong there. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt. He was the enforcer, uh, speak softly, carry a big stick, and of course, Abe Lincoln, who uh, passed the Emancipation Proclamation in 1883. So that's why he selected these, uh, these men. Now, we used, we used the navigation uh, system in, our, in, our, in the car, and when we got, I, I dialed this in, you can dial in a point of interest, you get there, and as you're coming up, the lady says, your destination is ahead on the right. 
She should have said four heads, actually. <laughs> so so uh, after we went to uh, Mount Rushmore, we went to the Crazy Horse Monument, which is a similar effort. Uh, it's an ind the Indians are, the Native Americans are building a, uh, a sculpt sculpting a mountain. It's not far away. And of course, I dialed this into the navigation system, and she was right. Your destination is ahead on the right. <laughs> so there's this model, and this is all they've done in 20 years here, blasting and so forth. There's, a, of course, a, 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 a museum, and they don't accept um, uh, federal funds, as Borglum did. Uh, but they took my $22 when I went in, so... That was federal money. This is the Black Hills of Dakota, and we went through Custer State Park. Strangely, Little Bighorn isn't anywhere near here. But why is it called the Black Hills? Well, if you look closely at the Ponderosa Pines, you'll see that the tips of the needles are black. So from a distance, the hills look black. It's the Black Hills. When you go through Custer State Park, it's an 85-mile uh, trip. It takes about six hours because you have all these bison on the road. So you have traffic jams, basically, with them uh, coming on the road. And also, they have these cuts through the mountains. Tunnels only eight feet wide. So you, have to, you only have about a foot clearance on either side. And you'll notice this particular, this is the first or second week of August. There's a lot of motorbikes there. And I, I thought, this can't be normal. Why is it? Well, I found out the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally occurs every August, has for the last 77 years. We didn't plan this. You can see, this is Sturgis. <laughs> the, uh, there's a lot of motorbikes, and you can see these are all gentlemen, older gentlemen sometimes. <laughs> They're the only ones that can afford $30,000 for a motorbike. But uh, this entire town, or uh, main road, is blocked off to traffic, and they just lined with motorbikes. This was what we saw. So that's not the normal situation. So the population of Wyoming is 873,000. The population of Sturgis is 773,000. They almost double the population of the, of the um, state. So the Devil's Tower National Park in Wyoming, here's the Devil's Tower. Now this played prominently in Close Encounters of the Third Kind. This was in the morning, but later that night, we were looking out of our, and this is what we <laughs> saw. <laughs> it was just amazing, you know? Now, the next one is the clip. It doesn't play, so it's da-da-da-da-da, boom. All the glass breaks, so I'm doing that for you. Um, there we go. You can see, this is the view from the uh, park was, uh, of this, and you can, these people actually climb it. They're actually, it's 860 feet to the top. It's a mesa. No, it's a butte. It's a butte. It's a small mesa. And you, when you get to the top, you can walk around. The first guy to go up there had to be rescued. <laughs> um, he stayed overnight. They don't permit you to stay overnight, but you can see this guy's brought all his gear. And I said to the park ranger, uh, so do these guys have to demonstrate some skill and that they can do this? He says, no, they just have to be down before sunset and sign a release. And I said, has anyone come down quicker than that? <laughs> and yes, he said, six since 1986. So it's not without some risk. Here he is here, and here's his partner down here. It's quite a, an event. Now, Yellowstone National Park is famous for Old Faithful. And that's a, a volcanic feature. It occurs regularly, that's why it's Old Faithful, and they actually know to pretty much five minutes or so, they publish, they post the times there. And uh, if you want to... This is Old Faithful being faithful. It goes up about 125 feet, so it's a, it's a subterranean chamber full of water that heats up, volcanic heating. And it gets to a certain point, there it turns is. into steam, and the steam propels the water out of the uh, 
Wow, look at that. Oh, this is audio here, too. Yeah. Yes, there is. Joan and I, here we <laughs> Careful are. Careful what you say there, Scott. Old Faithful in Yellowstone National Park. Yeah. I'll cut that in short, I guess. Move on. Oh, F5? How do you move forward? There it gets. Okay. So, in addition, there are uh, what they call the fountain paint pots. These are, again, hot springs, boiling water. You don't want to go in there. Uh, the colors are from minerals, copper sulfate and uh, sulfur uh, minerals here that uh, color the landscape. This is the Mormon Tabernacle, uh, Tabernacle, Salt Lake City. We got that. That was our kind of as far west as we got. This is the tabernacle. It's quite impressive. Here's uh, my wife in front and, uh, oh, wait a minute. She's gone. Oh, she's back. <laughs> I thought it was the rapture. <laughs> oh, no, she's back. All right. Okay, so good. Glad you stayed. Um, now we get to Nebraska. This is just where the eclipse begins, and it's, it's truly a bucket list event. I'd never been to uh, I've never seen a, a, a total eclipse before, and it kind of sneaks up on you. I had uh, cameras set up. I had a telephoto um, set up with a camera on a telescope and an intervalometer taking pictures in case I got distracted during the event. Here's uh, the corona, and I think that is, would that be Venus? Regulus? Regulus, yeah. Okay, and oh you get this 360 degree twilight effect around here. Of course, I wasn't paying much attention to that. Um, and that's the corona. And these are all pictures that just uh, I, I took. And here's, uh, you can see the prominences here and here and a, a diamond ring effect there. There's the diamond ring. There's another diamond ring. That's a yellow diamond, so it's not as good as the other one. Thank you very much. That's the so, questions? Don't ask me what the uh, photography settings were. Right? <laughs> no idea. Well, good. Thanks very much. Oh, there's a question? Sorry, how long was the trip? Uh, four weeks. Yeah. After the eclipse, how long did you stay down? Well, the eclipse occurred on the 21st. We got back on the 30th. So, we, But my cousin lived there, so we stayed there a while. <laughs> <laughs> the weather was good? The weather was absolutely perfect. It, was, it couldn't have been better. It was beautiful. And as they said, the guys in Grand, uh, Island. Grand, yeah, Grand Island, they came five hours west because they heard the weather was good. So it was very enjoyable. I would highly recommend it as a bucket list. Okay, thank you, Scott. Okay, thank you, Scott. Uh, our next speaker, another solar eclipse presentation, John Badalich. Come on down. And uh, why don't you hook yourself up uh, with this, and I'll close this off.
Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So, um, like uh, some of you, I decided to witness a uh, somewhat obscure um, astronomical event uh, called, and in contemporary parlance, it was called the Great American Eclipse. Um, in my neck of the woods, it's also uh, known as uh, Teton Totality in the Teton Mountains. So this is, uh, this is actually the location, I will talk about this some more, where, where, where we um, observed uh, the eclipse. Um, the exact site uh, was actually um, a secret from us. We were, this is a tour I took actually with MWT Tours, and it's a um, it's a, a tour company that specializes in astronomical tours. And when I booked this trip, um, I wanted to see the eclipse. This, this was maybe a year or maybe more in advance. And the next day, the price was going to go up two hundred dollars. So I said, "Well, if I'm going to do it, let's do it now." And I hadn't heard of this. So when uh, Charlene Norgrove, a few months later, I saw a presentation she did, and she went with MWT Tours, and it looked great, and I thought, oh, I was very confident in my decision. I was glad I, uh, I chose them. So I know they're a legit company. Um, it was, uh, so this was in, uh, in Victor, Idaho, um, which is uh, right on the border with Wyoming. It's just across the border. and. Um, we had almost 100 people, it was two coaches, and uh, we had names for our coaches called, uh, one was called Mercury, and one was Mars, and they lived up their name because I was on Mars, and the Mercury one was always faster, always got there first. Um, uh, there were four lecturers on this tour we had. We had uh, Dennis uh, Mamana, it's a noted educator and imager. We had uh, Dr. Linda Shore, who's the head of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. We had uh, Bob uh, Noya. He's a great guy. He's uh, his name is spelled N E N A E Y E, and he says he pronounced that Noya rhymes with paranoia. And uh, he was a former editor um, uh, of um, chief editor of Sky and Telescope, and then he was a senior science writer for NASA. And also we had our own Randy Atwood, who is the executive director of the RASC. So we had these uh, four lectures, and so along the trip, the, the whole trip was about 10 days, the whole tour, and, and so um, they spoke on various evenings after dinner. Um, okay, so here we are in, uh, in uh, Victor, Idaho, and we stayed a lot of uh, very comfortable places. Very, all the places were very comfortable, but this is, this is one of the most spectacular, is the famous Sun Valley resort in Idaho, and um, this is an outdoor skating rink. This is the middle of August. You can see there's some skaters on there. They had an indoor rink as well, and they saw people playing uh, shinny hockey. So uh, it was just a great location, and the night we were there, we were treated to, they had a, a full outdoor concert of um, orchestra and chorus and soloists of uh, uh, Verdi choral work, which is fantastic. So we're in this beautiful location in the mountains, and this glorious music coming out. So that was uh, definitely a night to remember, one of the highlights. Um, we also visited, um, this is the crater, um, Craters of the Moon National Monument. So it's all basalt, all lava flow, and uh, from uh, raging in age for about 15,000 years ago to 2,000 years ago. And it's a, it's a thousand square kilometers. And it's, it's quite, uh, I've never seen anything like it. And it's the, it's the largest one, I believe, in the continental US, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, this one here, if you can see, uh, this is uh, the crescent moon. This is uh, 26 days uh, old moon. So this is three days before the eclipse. And it was very hard to see. This was um, at Craters of the Monument National Park. And so I couldn't. You can sort of see it, and then you couldn't see it in the viewfinder in my camera at all, so I took a few pictures and I caught a little bit of it. But that was one of, it was, so it was broad daylight, it was about 11 o'clock in the, in the morning. Now we went, as Scott uh, also, we went to Yellowstone Park, it was on our itinerary, and this is uh, one of the hot springs, again with the colors, and Scott explained about them, so I don't have to explain them again, because I don't remember but why, uh, why the colors of different, uh, different elements. Um, so that was a neat place. Uh, uh, lots of herds of bison, um, as uh, Scott showed, I think, in Custer Park. And also, no visit is complete without uh, seeing Old Faithful. And uh, 
sure enough, it, uh, the tap turned on and there it went. But uh, we saw one of the higher ones. I guess it varies in heights, but we were told this is one of the, one of the ones we saw was one of the higher ones. So that was uh, quite spectacular as well. Um, oh, the other big highlight was whitewater rafting. And I've only gone once before. This is my second eclipse and my second time whitewater rafting. And uh, I went on the Otto River about 35 years ago. And this is on the Salmon River, which is a tributary of the Snake River. And it was just a hoot. Uh, I, I didn't, get, didn't fall out of the boat, although once there's a wave came, knocked me right back into the, into the raft. And that was, a, that was a real howl. So that was one of the highlights, uh, I think, only second only to the actual eclipse. We also went uh, to um, Sawtooth um, Wilderness Area, um, so the Sawtooth Mountain Range. And um, there was a senator, and this is the, um, he, he was one of the, uh, he did a lot of, he, I bet a lot about it, he did a lot of things, but one of the things he did was um, he fought for this. Um, he was a Democratic senator. And um, I like this, this was right, uh, there's a plaque there. I never knew anyone who felt self-important in the morning after spending the night in an open, uh, night in the open on an Idaho mountainside under a star-studded summer sky. So I think that's, that was very inspiring. And the other thing was Idaho is just a beautiful state. I don't think I'd ever thought of going there. Um, uh, but there's tons of wilderness. Apparently it's the most, um, most wilderness of any um, state save, uh, in the U.S. save Alaska. Now this is actually in Wyoming. Uh, this is the Teton Mountain Range. So this is uh, coming in uh, from Yellowstone Park, actually. This is going south. And we went to a state in Jackson Hole, uh, Wyoming, very, very old west town. So these are all made of uh, antlers, uh, elk antlers. And there's, this is like a town square. So there are four of them in the four corners. So it's a great town. Fine dining at uh, Bubba's Barbecue Restaurant, <laughs> which uh, they really, you know, uh, they, I think they capitalized on the eclipse. The whole town did, um, as you can uh, see. This was... Uh, it's actually Jackson Hole was also in the path of the eclipse. Uh, where we were was actually right in the center, so we had the longest eclipse. So, it was, so um, uh, this was very close uh, to our, this is where we stayed the, uh, more, uh, the night before the eclipse. Uh, we drove out to, um, to Victor, Idaho. And this is the, we, so what it was, it was a ranch, Lynn Canyon Ranch. And it's like a bed and breakfast. They also use it for weddings and other events, and we were the only guests there, the exclusive guests. It was just the 95 of us on 100 acres of land. So we had an acre of land for everybody, really. Uh, so you could go outside. This was in the morning. Um, uh, you could sit by the, um, uh, by the fire inside if you were cold or whatever. Many washrooms inside, which is very, very important. So it was, uh, it, it, it was very, we left there quite early. Uh, just we didn't want to. We wanted to beat the traffic to get there in plenty of time, and not, you know, we don't want to be coming in the last minute. And that was not a problem. Um, leaving was a problem. It was like a six hours to get back to Jackson Hole. It was just nuts. Uh, but it better being, you know, late after than before the event. Um, oh, this is a this is the part of the land. It's a nice shot, photo up. Uh, this is a covered wagon, beautiful Questar telescope there. Not mine. But uh, it was neat. Uh, it was there. Uh, so this is uh, this is some of our group uh, getting ready. This, this is already a uh, partial. Uh, it's after first contact. Uh, this is a shot I took. You can see some of the sunspot. This is just after first contact. And uh, this is Bob Noya, and you can see the shadow crescents uh, from the from the leaves. Um, so, uh, very cool. The other thing we saw where they talk about it in the film, uh, there's a video later, uh, but the shadow bands, and I really saw them clearly after the eclipse. Um, they weren't really subtle at all. Uh, so this is uh, my shot of the eclipse. Um, that is Regulus there. Um, I had a little point, a uh, Panasonic Lumen point and shoot so I use that for all I just took a picture to see if it turns out I took about two or three and that was the best one so I was happy with that it's a uh, mid totality oh and my uh, my wife as usual like I'm not always that aware of my surroundings 
And she was, uh, I have to give her credit, she says, look, look, look in the west, and this is also the whole sky around the horizon, you could see all that, because I'm transfixed looking at the, uh, at the, um, uh, at the eclipse. Now after, so this is after, so we get very hungry after an eclipse, so we have al fresco dining. Uh, outside, we had, uh, and washed down by our uh, local craft beer, the Grand Teton Brewery, so it was, a, it was a, a wonderful way to spend the day. Beautiful property. And uh, that's it, and I just wanted to show you a uh, video. Um, of, uh, taken by Chris Baldock, who's a member of London Center, I believe. Um, so he took this and he, he said, uh, he gave me permission to, uh, to use it here, and here we go. That's him there, actually. Now, the first uh, minute or so, there's no uh, sound. It's about six, five minutes long, this, um, this video. So you can see we're all setting up here. You know, this is actually fast. So you can see the planes. I saw a few planes go by. They're all like small, um, you know, uh, Cessnas or something. And um, so we're about 2,000 uh, meters up in altitude here. Uh, perfect conditions. Um, we were worried about the fires. Uh, when, when we were whitewater rafting, you could smell the smoke and see some haze in the morning. But by this time, when we got uh, here, there was nothing, nothing of consequence at all. And you can, as you can see, the sky was just fantastic. Um, so we're all, uh, everybody's setting up their, uh, their stuff. Um, About a minute. Okay. 125. There's, look, there's the shadow. It's darkening. Yeah. 115. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, Here we go. Here we go. Look for shadow bands. Shadow bands! I got them! <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Look how fast they're going. Oh, yeah. Obvious. Nice. Oh, yeah. 49 seconds. They're going this way? Yeah, they're going yeah, there they go. on the top. Yeah, look at that. Oh, they're so obvious. That's incredible. 30 seconds. Oh, my God. So dark. Oh, sunset colors. Sunset colors already. There's Venus. 30 oh seconds. Oh, yeah, you can see uh, to the top right. You guys stand back, please. Yes, yes. I'm taking my filter off. Oh, here it goes. Here comes Diamond Ring. Yeah. Here it comes. Are you ready? Oh, my yeah. God. Ah! Diamond Ring. Yeah. Corona. Uh, Corona. Yeah. I, whenever I see these, um, I always get chills. Like I've been there, and, I, and it still gives me chills every time I, I watch. Oh Look at that Corona. Look at the Corona streamer. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Look. That's uh, regular is to the bottom, should be the bottom left. The top right is should be Venus. When I saw it, I got so excited. I thought it was Jupiter. Jupiter's further. I was Jupiter, Jupiter, and somebody corrected me saying, oh, that was Venus. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that.
I don't see any sunspots though. <laughs> well, I see a big sunspot. <laughs> 30 seconds to go. Should start brightening up there. There's brightening into the cliffs. So it's already been a minute and a half? Yeah. It's never, long, it's never long enough. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's true. Get ready for third contact. Hey, is that crow? Oh Flock of crows. Yeah. Photosphere. I hope somebody's getting that. Oh, yes. <laughs> Photosphere. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> look, look at the meadow light up back there. Look, you still got shadow here. Yeah. Still got Venus. Oh yeah, that was spectacular. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Chris put his video up on uh, YouTube. Um, and I can't remember the, uh, I think I looked up uh, Idaho Eclipse, picture Idaho Eclipse, I think. Uh, I don't know, it's a good question. Yeah, they, they did a good job, whatever. Yeah, so. Anyway, that's. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Luckily, no, there were no. We had we had great luck with bugs. No bugs at all. It was just great. Anyway, thank you very much. Are there any questions? Great. Oh, great. <laughs> All right, and Ron McNaughton, come on down, our final speaker, a visitor from another solar system. And nothing as beautiful as the eclipse expeditions. Wow. Okay. Uh, I'm just looking for mine. Oh, right there. Um, I wasn't going to do this talk because I've got other projects on the go, but then when I heard there was uh, uh, a speaker backed out, I figured I'll put it together. So this is a, as a result of probably two days worth of work. So anyway, um, we might moan and groan about politics nowadays, but I think we live in an awesome era. And this is another discovery, I think, like the gravitational waves that are uh, uh, so, so important. Now, let's see if I can work out how to do that. All right. Um, before I get to it, I'm going to talk a bit about solar system objects and comets. And this comet is 2P Enki. And uh, it was the second one, of course. Uh, the comet itself was discovered by somebody else, but Enki worked out the orbit. And then eventually, that's the first person to see it who gets uh, credit. And uh, it looks something like this with the sun, and its perihelion is about a third of the way out. And we actually have Enki's orbit near Toronto called the DDO. And I actually measured the length and width, and it is the shape of the Enki orbit. And I think that was done for a major astronomy conference at the uh, DDO uh, a long time ago, but I'm not sure about that. And if uh, this used to have a sundial, I don't know if it's put back yet. Um, and if that's the sun and if this is the Earth's orbit, the closest approach is about one third of the distance. And Karen Mortfield took this because I wasn't feeling well from a copper roof uh, using my camera. Wait a minute, I gotta go back a bit. So there are numbers that define an orbit. And the perihelion is one, the peridate or the date that it reaches is another, and the eccentricity is another, and that gives a shape, whether it's close to a circle or long and narrow, and I'll get to that later. And there are three angles that are involved in the uh, defining an orbit. One of them is the angle between the plane of the ecliptic and the plane of the motion, and the other two angles, uh, maybe someone can explain to me, but uh, uh, they're involved. So we have a total of six numbers that define any path around the sun. 
the distance of perihelion, the date and time of perihelion, that's one, of course, the eccentricity, and three angles. Years ago, um, after New Horizons passed through Pluto, I thought, I'm going to try and take a picture of Pluto. So I drove near Luther Lake, northwest of uh, Orangeville, set up my telescope when it was uh, uh, around midnight, I took a picture of Pluto. And then I went up there two days later and took another picture of Pluto. And I'll give you about 20 seconds to see if you can see the dot that has moved from the left photo at the top to the right at the bottom. Can anybody see it? All right. Who's right? And that is Pluto. And when I first looked at the first pictures, I was just overjoyed to see a dot that I thought was the right one. And then I had to go two days later. And I wish I'd gone a third day. Because if I'd gone the middle day, this was the 21st and the 23rd, or another day, I would have had enough information to get an idea of the orbit of Pluto. Because there are six numbers that define an orbit. And with three observations, getting the RA and deck and knowing the time, I could work out what the orbit is. And every time a moving device or moving object is found in the sky, the powers that be try and get three observations, and then they can work out the different coordinates, such as the eccentricity that I'm going to explain in a little bit, or the inclination that's the tilt, or those, uh, those other numbers. Okay, eccentricity. Um, and if I'd had more time, I would have got a better diagram than this. If an orbit has an eccentricity of zero, it's a perfect circle. And planets like Earth are close to zero, but not quite. If it's 0.5, it's uh, more elongated. And as it gets closer and closer to one, it gets longer and narrower um, as the shape of the orbit. If E equals one, that's a problem. And that means uh, an object uh, from way beyond the solar system could have virtually no speed. It approaches the sun, it goes faster and faster, it goes around the sun quickly, and then it goes back out and it's going to drift away to have virtually no speed compared to us. That's if it's exactly uh, one. If it's got an eccentricity of greater than one, that means it's got a positive total energy, so it's going to be quickly moving towards the solar system, whiz around the sun, and then it's going to have enough speed to go out. Now let's go back to this chart here of the different um, uh, comets. Now this was made about uh, five years ago when I gave a talk on Thomas comets, and I just used it again. The periodic comets are mostly here, with relatively low eccentricity, relatively close to the plane of the solar system they actually are from the Kuiper Belt. But there are a whole bunch of comets that are very, very far away from the sun at their furthest approach. Almost are escaping into space. If somebody just gave them a kick, probably they would uh, escape from our solar system. And these are clustered around one. But there's the odd comet with an eccentricity greater than one. And the one that the cursor is pointed to can you see the cursor there? That's um, a comet uh, Bowell from 1980. And when they worked backwards to where it came from using the coordinates, it turns out it had a close pass near Jupiter. And Jupiter sped it up. And it whizzed close to the sun. It came back out. And it's moving away from the solar system. That was the most uh, high eccentricity comet until Wait a minute, okay. Sorry, I haven't practiced this enough, so I'll, I'll go back. Um, I was talking about going past Jupiter. Um, if an object goes past a planet and the planet can accelerate it or it can decelerate it, uh, so often when something goes past a planet, it can get accelerated to enough to leave the space. Anyway, then came this discovery of and I have no idea how to say it, Oumuamua, Oumuamua. And I'm going to discuss, all right. Um, it was discovered first in a telescope, in uh, uh, the Pan-STARRS telescope. 
and they picked a Hawaiian name. I think they talked to some experts in Hawaiian language, and they picked the Hawaiian name. And it literally means a messenger from afar arriving first, except it also means scout. And a lot of people wanted to name it Rama after the Arthur, Arthur C. Clarke story where um, a, uh, an object comes from elsewhere and it turns out it's a, a rocket and people explore it and everything. I haven't read it. Has anybody read that one, by the way? Any of the Rama? Okay, am I mostly right? Okay. I, I just want to explain the notation. Uh, comets were something like 2P, which means the second periodic comet. And this is the first, and the I stands for interstellar. Of course, that's the year. And the U stands for the particular month, which is the uh, second half of October. Here's the discovery image. I missed Ralph's talk on vision and aging because there must be something wrong with my eyes because I never see red lines like this in the sky when I look through my telescope. I, I don't know. Um, this is the discovery image. It doesn't look like much, but it was enough. And they noticed right away that it moved really quickly, and that led to further discoveries. Incidentally, the team from uh, Karen Meech's uh, uh, paper, I've looked at two papers on this, includes Wa Robert Warrick, who is from London, and he's going to be speaking at the London Centre this Friday. So if anybody wants to know more about it and perhaps correct information from him, uh, just drive down to London Centre. You know, they have a website and you can, you can find out when. I doubt if I'll go, but I might. And Robert Jedeke, who also is uh, related to Peter Jedeke, and I don't know if they're Canadian or whatever, but anyway, there is a Canadian connection to this. Where did it come from? Well, this, it's hard to make a three-dimensional diagram, but it basically came from above the solar system near Vega, which is, will be our pole star in, I don't know, uh, 10,000 years or so. So um, this is uh, July, August, September 9th, it was closest to the sun, or perihelion. Then it made a sharp turn around the sun, October, and it was October 19th that the image that I showed you was taken. Can you imagine the panic of experts on this to say, wow, we got to study this. Putting the proposals together to get directors, uh, discretionary time at telescopes, and um, uh, putting everything together. It must have been a mad rush, and I'm sure some people went through a few weeks without any sleep. The observations that I'm going to talk about were taken about here, and right now it's somewhere around Jupiter. I, or, yeah, it's somewhere around Jupiter. Okay, its speed compared to the sun, it was 87 kilometers a second at perihelion. And in interstellar space, it's 26. And my calculations is it's about 11,500 years to travel a light year. Now, it comes from the area of Vega that, of course, is fairly uh, high up. And I estimate it would take about... Uh, uh, 2,800 years to get to where Vega is now, but everything in our galaxy is moving. And it turns out that the ring nebula, uh, this is the center of the galaxy, of course, and we're here. The ring nebula is fairly close to Vega, so we're looking a little bit, not across the galaxy, but a little bit into it. And um, uh, Vega wasn't there when it started, so it did not come from Vega, so Jodie Foster doesn't have to worry about finding her father or whatever. Um, it, it came. I actually heard that some people think it might have came from Carina, and it's almost as if this part of the galaxy is moving at a different speed than this. I, I don't know, and needless to say, this is, uh, this is being worked on. So is it a comet or an asteroid? This thing's moving so fast, Oh, yes, I know what I was going to say. Um, near Vega, there's no evidence of any distant planet there. And, you know, they've talked about finding Planet 9 that might be out there. Well, it's not in that part of the sky. So they're pretty sure that is, it's not being deflected by something big out there, but it came from somewhere else. So this is a photo from before processing. Then they processed it. 
and they worked out how the brightness declines with distance. So this is the angular radius in the center. So this is one arc second, this is 10. This is the maximum, so this is 10%, uh, like logarithm of one, so that's 10%, and this is 1%. See how it drops really quickly? And actually, a star would drop a boat like that. But wouldn't you expect a comet to have a little bit of dust coming off and a layer? So for some reason, this object not only is from uh, going faster than anything else, but it doesn't produce any dust. But this object has gone close to the sun inside Mercury's orbit and gone out. It's been close to the sun for a fair amount of time, so why not? This is a picture that Philae took of the comet uh, churyumov garamasenko 69P um, for the few days before it ended up dying. And this surface, or at least parts of it, have volatiles that when the sun hits it, they send off dust that end up making the comet tail. But this doesn't. So why? One explanation. Cosmic rays over the million years or whatever it was in space removed the volatiles down to about a half a meter because the heat from the sun only could have gone that deep. So that's one theory. Another is this is an asteroid with few volatiles. And in our solar system, somewhere a little inside Ceres, we have the difference between the snow line and the inner planets, it's so hot that any water that gets in a planet is going to be uh, sublimate away unless it's cold enough, um, uh, unless there's enough gravity to hold it like we do. So this thing probably came from here, or maybe it came be because it was knocked out of a planet. But how would you get a shape like that knocked out of a planet? I don't know. Maybe, Chris, you know something about the geology of it, but uh, I'll get to that in a minute. I see you shaking your head. Then they took a spectrum, and they look at the different colors, and uh, this object that was called A, but now is called 1i, um, has this spectrum with quite a wide range, but it looks like a C-type asteroid that would be uh, carbonaceous chondrites, or an S-type asteroid that is a stony has a different pattern, so it's not like those two, but it's similar to D-type asteroids and some comets, but this is shaky data, and it turns out that some of the Trojan asteroids, either behind Jupiter's orbit or in front, are similar when they take the spectra. But again, it's shaky data, and uh, they're not quite sure. Now I get to the light curve, which is really strange. There's so many strange things about this object. There's one team led by Karen Meech, including uh, uh, those two Canadians, and I've coded them in red, and they were able to get observing time on the Canada-France Hawaii Telescope. There's a UK infrared telescope and Keck in Hawaii, and the very large telescope in Gemini South in Chile. I don't know which one is north and which is south. I, I don't know. Any Chilean experts here? Okay, anyway, the other team in blue by David Jewett and a few others who found the first um, uh, Kuiper Belt object uh, other than Pluto, uh, they got time on the uh, Norwegian Optical Telescope? No, Nordic Optical Telescope in uh, uh, the Canary Islands and a couple of telescopes in um, uh, Arizona. What have I done? So, here's some light curves. This thing gets amazingly bright and faint as it tumbles. So, this is the magnitude. So, as you go down here, it gets fainter. So, this is magnitude 25. And notice that the error bars are much larger for the faint observations than for the bright ones. I guess this was daytime, so they didn't see it. Then, the next day on October 26th, like this is what, six days after the discovery? Seven? This was six days after the discovery. That's pretty fast to get telescope time, uh, director discretionary time. Um, so here they have good data where it's, sorry, and then wobbly data there. The Meech light curves uh, uh, and, and this as well. 
Then the other group, what they did is they arranged it so it was all in the same cycle. So you have this from one day, this from another, this from another, and they're uh, able to analyze. So what causes the varying brightness of these things? Well, it could be there's a bright spot like Ceres on it, or I think it's Iaptus, the moon that has a dark hemisphere. That's one of the facts I wanted to check before I did it, but I ran out of time. So here's a summary from Karen Meech's group and David Jewett's group. They get close periods, and eight hours is a typical time for asteroids to um, get bright and faint. The brightness range from this group is two and a half magnitudes, which is 10 times factor. This group is only two magnitudes, which is 6.3. If it were a cylinder, and I forgot to bring it in, oh, I'll use this. If it's a cylinder, this would be the faint part, this would be the bright part, faint, bright. Do I mess up the, okay. Now, I don't know why, but they used a different assumption of albedo, which kind of messes up the calculation because these guys predicted this dimension and these people predicted a different dimension. But when you can only see the light, the brightness of an object, you have to assume a certain brightness to estimate how big it is. So the answer to how big it is is nobody really knows. But this is the, the two science papers. Okay, for comparison, Comet 67P is uh, four kilometers long and about a 12-hour rotation. Now, notice that this is, it's sort of like a duck, and actually they've proven that it's made out of two asteroids that gently nudge together over the eons in the outer area, and then slowly, I don't quite know what process, but they're together. But if this thing spin too thick, spun too quickly, I think the two bits would fly apart because there's nothing really holding them together. Now, if you have this object, Oumuamua, 200 meters long and an eight hour rotation, that is so fast, this would have to have strength to hold it together. Now, I was talking to a friend or emailing a friend about this and he talked about, was a Devil's Mountain, Scott, that you saw in, um, where was that? Wyoming. And he was wondering if there happened to be a structure like that on another planet and maybe something hit it and knocked that into space. I don't know. I don't know what would cause an object to form this way with enough tensile strength to be able to rotate. But there's always the option that it's not natural. It's a rocket. And we blew it. We didn't chase after it to say hi, but you know, uh, whatever. But I heard, I, I, I read just a, a day ago that the Green Bank Radio Telescope is going to observe it for 10 hours starting at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And I checked just before the meeting on my cell phone if there was any announcement that they had found ET, but uh, nothing, nothing got on the news. Maybe there's too much about Trump to fit that in. Um, this is an article in the February 1997 Astronomy by David Stern, who was the principal investigator for the New Horizons mission. And he talks about all sorts of reasons that there are millions or billions or trillions of these objects, including several right now between us and the sun. But we, can, we have trouble detecting them. But there are clearly a lot of objects from elsewhere that are coming towards us and we're just finding to, um, just finding out about them. And just as gravitational waves started with one and then you get more and more and learn more and more, I predict this discovery with better observing techniques are going to find more and more visitors from other planets and boy, we live in an exciting time. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Any questions for Rob? Yes. Do you think James Webb will make a difference when that gets goes up? The James Webb telescope, when that goes up, do you think that's going to make a difference in observation? 
Uh, is it working? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the James Webb Telescope, I don't know if it's that good a uh, telescope for wide angle views. And to do searches for objects like this, you need a telescope that can see a wide angle patch of sky and you do continual surveys all around. But when they find an object, that James Webb would be perfect to focus on it to um, get information. And I'm impressed with the telescopes they were able to get online, but I'm astounded that they didn't throw everything we have at that object. You know, Hubble, all the Kecks, there's a monster telescope in the Canary Islands that I think is the biggest in the world. Why wasn't everything thrown at it to get the best possible observations? And it looks, at least on the basis of the two papers I saw, only a few telescopes were, were they got director's time to, uh, to do it. Um, but if James Webb, or once James Webb comes in and they find another, it will provide good data about these as well. And the advantage is it can watch it continually if they can get the time because, um, you know, you can only watch for sort of 12 hours and then it sets and you've got to count on other telescopes to make the difference. So to have a space telescope observing it I think would be wonderful. Did I answer your question? Yep. Okay. Yes. Hi, first of all, thanks for that very fascinating presentation. Thank you. And when you were talking about the orbits of these asteroids and comets, uh, the eccentricity, so say when the eccentricity is greater or equal to one, say you have a parabolic or hyperbolic orbit, does this mean that the orbit is unbounded? Say you have a comet that moves in, approaches the perihelion, moves past, exits the solar system and never once again enters the solar system. Exactly. Really? Yes. And Fascinating. There's, I, I showed the last article by Alan Stern and he says there's so much evidence in terms of theories of how the solar system formed. The definition of a planet is it clears its orbit and we clear our orbit by some object going close to us and we deflect it and it goes out. Oh, really? So anything with a hyperbolic orbit, great, uh, eccentricity greater than one, is going to leave the solar system unless it happens to go near a heavy object and then it's going to get bent back in again. I oh, see. Sorry, Paul. <laughs> so the limit or the upper threshold for the eccentricity of a bounded orbit is, is one. Uh, of a what? Of a bounded orbit. Say yes. a, a circle or an ellipse. I see. Okay, wow. I, I just want to make a little caveat here. Okay. Um, the eccentricities change as the objects move out. Because when it's close to the sun, the mass that is attracting it is the sun's mass. But as it goes further out, we're talking about something that's 1.002. Okay? As it gets further out, now it's attracted by the whole mass in the solar system, Jupiter, Saturn, etc. And it actually, that extra mass slowly can decrease the eccentricity, so it might come back again if it's, say, 1.002 or, I mean, I don't know the exact, but, but there is a small factor like that. Okay? So this sounds like it would possibly go into, say, non-Euclidean geometry oh. because of the masses of yeah. all of these bodies. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. All right. Thank you. I then have one more thing to say. Merry Christmas, everybody. Thank you very much, Ron, and uh, thank you for coming to the rescue one more time with a last-minute presentation. Uh, oh, we have some people lining up to speak. I know I, know, I knew about Blake, but we also uh, have uh, Ian Wheelband. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, Blake's going to start the computer up. Um, as uh, Paul said, I'm Ian. Um, I'm your Education and Public Outreach Committee Chairperson. Over the last year, we've been working really hard on lots of things. I mean, not only Cubs, Scouts, high schools, NOVA programs. Um, we've been doing a lot of work at the DDO and with Richmond Hill. First of all, it was getting the 
the uh, expression of interest prepared. Several people in the room that uh, helped to do that. And then Richmond Hill chose us and the David Dunlap Observatory Defenders to present public outreach to the, uh, to the citizens of the greater Toronto area. Um, what we wanted to uh, update you now, um, first off actually, uh, one of the, the pleasures of, of working with, with all the education and public outreach has been uh, starting to work with the David Dunlap Observatory Defenders people. Uh, lights back on again, please, Sean. Can you turn the lights back on again for a moment, please? Thanks. Um, we have the leaders of the David Dunlap, uh, the DDO Defenders here with us tonight, uh, Dr. Ian Shelton and Tuba Kokte. So it's been <laughs> they're, they're longtime RASC members as well, and uh, as I say, it's been a pleasure working with them, and, and I'm really looking forward to that in the, in the future of the DDO. So uh, soon we'll be inking the, the plan to share the, uh, the public outreach with, with uh, the Defenders. And um, to that end, we have recently uh, asked for and got a committee of people to, to run it on behalf of, of our side of it. Um, and I want to introduce your new DDO chairperson, uh, Dr. Bharavi uh, Shankar. So she started out back as a, as a high school kid um, in RASC, and she did her high school um, uh, volunteer hours with us and then went away to school for lots of years. Uh, got a couple of degrees and a PhD in planetary science. So, somebody who's interested in outreach, uh, that she, I feel, was, I felt was the perfect person, and so did the rest of the committee members you see there to be the chairperson. So, now that the committee struck, and we have uh, uh, three people, I think, here tonight. So, stand up the other people that are in the committee, please. Blake's already standing. Standing Arnold and Chris, and the others, uh, we all know Eric Briggs. Oh, hooray. Uh, Dr. Shankar couldn't come tonight, and uh, Liza Hancock couldn't either. But, kind of ceremoniously, I'm going to hand over the baton to them now, because uh, uh, they're the new people that are going to look after the observatory for us. I'll, I'll be helping them and probably doing some presentations as well. But on to Blake. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, my name is Blake Dankaroa. Thanks for uh, some time um, this evening. Um, the, there's lots to do. Um, uh, if you've been a member for some time, for a few years, or, or um, going back even further, um, before we were running programs there uh, proper and it was U of T, you know that um, the university put on regular programs there on, on weeknights um, and uh, weekends, um, particularly in the summertime. So our expression of interest um, with the town has um, many facets to it, and we want to um, initiate programs very much like we did before. So speakers' talks, um, uh, the administration building in the um, in the presentation room, uh, tours of the telescope, um, uh, uh, amateurs on the lawn with their telescopes. Um, we want to receive, as we have before, um, youth, uh, school groups, uh, cubs, scouts, et cetera, et cetera. So there's lots that, that we want to do, and um, we're, we're going to need a lot of help. So there are mem many um, volunteer opportunities, uh, and uh, uh, we're, we're going to need help in a, in a lot of different areas. Um, lots of you are already volunteering on a regular basis, and, and I don't want to sound that we wouldn't appreciate your help, but we also don't want you to get burnt out. <laughs> so we're interested in seeing some new blood, some new people coming out and helping out with the people. Um, and and uh, if you're a little bit anxious about that, if you feel like, oh, I don't know very much about astronomy, it doesn't matter. Um, there are many things where um, we, we need um, help herding cats. We, we need um, help with just people management um, at big events. Um, we need people to help um, the kids in the craft room and, and things like that. Um, so there's all, many, many facets to, to what we're looking for in terms of skill and knowledge and um, time that you can commit to it and, and so on. So you don't have to know anything about astronomy. We're 
going to help with uh, training um, and support and things like that too. So if again you want to help out, um, but you're looking for some some support, we're we're very uh, interested and able to to do that. Um, there's specialized things like speakers, um, and, and the, presumably they have some specialty knowledge and are comfortable with presenting and things like that ahead of the public. But but um, again, there's a broad range of skills that, that we'll need, we need help with. Um, we'll be doing daytime events there as well as evening events. So some solar observing and again, school visits and things like that. There, there's also an opportunity like we've done before where um, people that are interested in getting their volunteer hours or community hours um, maybe high school students and so on, like um, Bariva did uh, 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 many years ago, um, then uh, that, that's something that we're looking for, those types of volunteers and for supporting those volunteers. Um, and we'll, we'll interview people and ga gauge their um, sort of availability and personality style and find good roles and, and good uh, activities for them. Um, so something. So this is something for you to think about. Are, are you interested in helping out? And I'm taking names and numbers um, uh, tonight. So if you are interested in helping out, please see me. Um, you you can also um, uh, contact us by email. I'll show you those in a moment. Um, but I would also like you to think about um, maybe nominating people. Maybe you know somebody that um, uh, you think is quite good. Um, would be uh, really good in, in something like this. Maybe, maybe they don't feel like they have the ability or where at all, but, but give them a nudge, ask them if you can nominate them for that role, and if they're willing, then, then that's great. We'd love to hear with, uh, from them. Maybe, maybe they're not, not um, uh, interested in, in doing something without invitation. Well, I, I invite everybody to, to help out. Um, so again, please please feel free to contact me or um, uh, any of the other people that, that are on the team, Chris and Arnold and so on. Uh, we're here this evening, happy to talk to you about that. Um, and there's a couple of email addresses that you could communicate with. Um, uh, but Ravi is monitoring the, um, the email sent to ddo at raskto.ca and I'll receive emails that are sent to volunteer at um, rasko.ca. Um, any questions for me at this stage? Uh, Arnold, I saw you first, sir. We anticipate our first active um, outreach activity. Will that be as early as January? I, I think that's the, the plan, um, roughly. Uh, the town has um, asked us to prepare a schedule with activities starting in. January in Q1, so we're ramping up quickly um, for that. Chris might have a better sense of any specific dates at this stage, but I don't know of, of any at this point. But we do want to ramp up quickly, and, and it's, it's a busy time of year for everybody, but um, I anticipate that we'll be running programs in January, yeah. Uh, did I see a, a question over here? Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> so um, one of the things that we did in the past was that we would have like a speaker's night um, in the, the lecture room um, and then a tour of the observatory and skies permitting, we would have telescopes and all on. And invariably, those last year or the last couple of years, those were happening on Friday nights and Saturday nights. Um, so I think we're going to mimic a program like that. Um, but uh, school groups would be received in weekdays, in daytime stuff. So uh, we got everything and uh, anything in, in between there, yeah. So could everybody hear that? So. Daytime, mornings, afternoons, and evenings. Yeah, yeah, the whole gamut, all of it. <laughs> yes, indeed. So there'll be programs delivered by RAS. There'll be programs delivered by the DDOD. Um, so lot, lots going on. 
Um, and it, so it's all hands on deck, Shirley. Uh, is there any uh, hope of getting one of these uh, portable planetariums? Well, if I told you that. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're looking at all kinds of um, solutions. Um, and that might be one that we use a portable uh, 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 observing dome thing. What are they called? Um, observatory? Port plan portable planetary. Um, so in inflatable, and, and we can get maybe 15 people in those and, and um, with a spherical projector. And um, So they're, a nice thing about those is they can be taken to a school um, where that may be a much more affordable solution um, for a program with a school group rather than them renting a bus and all, all that sort of stuff. So, so we're looking at that, but we might, it, we might be able to use a, 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 an, a, an object like that, that those, those types of portable um, structures at the DDO grounds. Yeah. Yep. Would you, would you um, reinstall the Skylab that we had to So in the past, we had the Skylab, which was um, a dual projector set up using Stellarium. Um, and um, uh, we could do star shows there, much like what Ed was doing this evening. Um, and we would like to do that again. We would like to make use of that facility. Hopefully we can use that very room because it was set up well for that. Um, and it was a good size. But that, that's part of what we're working out logistically um, right now, um, uh, what spaces can be used. And, and if we can't use that space, you know, is there another room that, that can be uh, developed for that same sort of purpose? So some of the specifics, I, um, some of it we don't know yet. We're at the very early stages because we're waiting for the, the town to provide us information about what, what we can do in the building. Um, and, you know, the, the revised fire code uh, limitations and things like that. But we'll, we'll provide as much of that information as we can as soon as, soon as we know that. We're happy to share all that. Yeah. So our, we're um, looking to build some websites. We're working out that too, exactly where, where it will sort of all be and live. Um, but that's our intention, is to provide a lot of information like that in maybe in a, a central, separate, independent website that's uh, maybe owned by the town. Um, and we'll support the content for that and so on. But again, we're hammering all that out right now. We're working out the details of it. If, if um, uh, we need to, we can provide a lot of this information within our, our website as well. Um, but we'll probably have a separate website and we'll link to, to that website from ours. We'll have lots of good information there. So it's all, it's all happening quite quickly, but uh, we will keep providing more and more information. We'll certainly use our other outlets too, like the, the, uh, the newsletter, um, the Scope magazine, um, and we're, we're, of course, going to support or embrace social media um, for lots of communications as well. So you'll find information on lots of different sources. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I've taken up lots of time. Thanks a lot. Um, and again, I'll hang around for a bit after the meeting. Feel free to talk to me about if you're interested in, in helping out um, uh, at the DDO in any way. So thanks a lot for your time. Thank you, Blake. And next is Allard uh, with the announcements. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Allard. Um, I'm standing in for Ralph. Ralph Chow, our president, is traveling right now. I am his uh, stand stunt double. Uh, doing something. Here. Which one is it? A very brief presentation on the uh, upcoming events for the next uh, six weeks. Um, we have a speaker's night coming up just in the new year on January 10th. It will be on a Wednesday as usual here at the Ontario Science Centre, the same room. Um, you're welcome to come here uh, 7 o'clock onwards to socialize and the meeting itself will start at 7.30. And the speaker will be Randy Atwood, our uh, National uh, Executive Director and he'll be talking about the Voyager 40 year old mission uh, and still running uh, a fascinating mission uh, definitely worth 
seeing this talk. Um, the next recreational astronomy night will be on January 24th, uh, on Wednesday, again, in the same room here. Uh, also, with a pre-meeting option here to be here at 7 o'clock. Um, the presentations for next time are uh, a sky this month by Andy Beaton, um, something about fake news and mysteries and misconceptions probably, and conspiracies uh, by Alex Stanmere. Uh, there's still one slot open if you uh, would like to present something, come and see Paul Markle here um, and discuss what you would like to do. Um, speakers are always welcome. We uh, also have a new uh, uh, series of solar observing at the Science Center. Uh, it will be this time on Saturday, uh, Saturday January 27th. We're starting at 10 uh, and we'll uh, observe the uh, sun until noon. Um, the, uh, by the way, what is the cloud out uh, day, Sean? Is there a cloud date? Is there a date when, uh, if it's cloudy? Yeah, the following Saturday. The telescope's needed, uh, or if you don't have a telescope or a solar telescope, you're still welcome to volunteer. Um, uh, we also need people to uh, just talk to the public um, uh, or to just help people come to the telescopes. Uh, go, go, uh, no goals will be on the forum, uh, not Yahoo anymore. Uh, the website, Twitter, and uh, Facebook as well. And then we have our two uh, night observing events. Um, the first uh, dark sky party will be next week. Uh, fingers crossed if it's clear. We'll have a window starting on the 18th of Monday and then all the way to the 21st. Uh, and it will be at Long Suit Conservation Area. The City Star Party uh, is not until the end of January, starting uh, with the window on Monday the 22nd, and will be at Bayview Village Park. Um, for both, uh, if you have a telescope, drop by. If you don't have a telescope, um, you should definitely also drop by. Uh, uh, everyone's <coughs> eager to show the views uh, with their telescope, so don't feel like you don't have to or couldn't be able to come because you don't have a telescope. Um, Go no call uh, no calls are on the website the homepage. Uh, we got a, quite a few questions about uh, from people who don't know our organization very well when the no call or go calls are posted. It's very late in the day often, so check around four five o'clock five thirty. Um, five o'clock is what we aim for yeah uh, before they are live online. So a little bit of patience is necessary with uh, the crazy Ontario weather. Um, we also announced on the forum, Twitter, and Facebook. And then there's, of course, the CEO. If you'd like to um, go to CEO, I don't think the road is accessible anymore for the couple of months. Um, so you can still walk in, I believe. Um, and just contact uh, CEA bookings at rest.co.ca. Uh, the member or the uh, member benefits uh, the telescope loan program. Um, uh, some of the members of that committee are here. I can raise your hand. Three, yeah. So if you would like to borrow a telescope, sorry. Right now, as tonight. Wow. <laughs> it's a handy, compact, uh, nice aperture. Uh, um, it is winter time, so there is a little bit more availability, but books, book quickly if you can. Um, you can either pick it up uh, or pick it up here at a meeting. And then the last meeting is the, the first upcoming meeting, uh, and that's the drinks uh, after this meeting. Uh, we'll have uh, a drink at the Granite Brewery Pub, uh, which is on Mount Pleasant. Um, just a couple of uh, 100 meters south of uh, Eglinton. And there's free parking, and usually in the back room. All right. Everybody, happy holidays.
Thank you. Uh, and before you go, we have calendars for sale. Uh, Tom, you handling that? Okay. Very good. Thank you for coming. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year.